I guess we will get started. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, event, uh, SDD404, uh, Amazon RDS for Microsoft SQL Server Deep Dive. Uh, my name is Gim Sim Chua, and I'm a product manager for Amazon Web Services. Um, with me today is uh, Phil uh, Intihar, from, uh, also from Amazon Web Services. He's our database engineer, and also Miguel Joao from OutSystems. So in today's deep dive session, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you can build high availability and reliability systems using some of the exciting new features uh, that we have released in AWS. Uh, I will also talk a little bit about some of the uh, new instance and storage types that uh, Andy spoke about today in his uh, keynote speech this morning uh, that will provide more cost-effective computing. Um, and I will also uh, go into uh, some traditional uh, and well-established techniques for creating high-performance databases. And then lastly, I'll invite um, Miguel up to stage, uh, and he will share with us how OutSystems uh, leverages uh, SQL Server uh, to build uh, their OutSystems platform. So um, in May of this year, uh, we released a new feature that allowed um, our customers uh, to launch RDS SQL Server uh, in uh, multi-AZ. Now, multi-AZ uses SQL Server's native mirroring technology to provide enhanced availability and reliability. Uh, what multi-AZ basically is, is an, it is an automatic, synchronous replication of your database to a totally different standby instance that lives in a different availability zone. So how does um, multi-AZ work? Well, here's a typical uh, architecture diagram of an application that uses uh, Microsoft SQL Server at, for its database layer. Uh, the application is configured uh, to use uh, Microsoft SQL Server through its DNS name. Because it is running in multi-AZ, uh, the data is synchronously replicated in a standby instance. And this standby instance lives in a totally different availability zone with its own uh, physical infrastructure. However, it does have high-speed network connectivity to other availability zones uh, in that region. And lastly, there's also another uh, SQL Server that resides in a third availability zone acting as the witness. Now, the purpose of this witness is to pull the master database periodically to ensure uh, that it is uh, running uh, up and running and online and functioning normally. So let's see what happens uh, when the master database goes offline due to uh, some service failure. Well, the witness will notice that the master database is offline and, auto uh, and automatically cause a failover to happen. Uh, the DNS server will now point to uh, the standby instance. And because the application is configured to uh, using the DNS uh, name, it does not need to be reconfigured to point to the standby instance. Now, after the failover, RDS SQL Server will then automatically uh, create a new standby uh, that will reside in another uh, availability zone. So I'd like to go over some of the uh, multi-AZ best practices. Uh, first, uh, you can configure database events to monitor failovers. Uh, you can, uh, f uh, for instance, during a failover, uh, be in, uh, notified uh, that the event happened uh, through email or text messaging. And because to ensure uh, database consistency, uh, we have made sure that Amazon RDS uh, mirrors all your databases uh, in that instance. Uh, if, however, you do not want uh, certain databases to be mirrored, uh, you're welcome to 
set up another uh, instance in single AZ and move those databases that you do not want merit over to that instance. Also, if you cache your uh, DNS data, uh, we suggest and highly recommend that you set your uh, time to live or TTL value to less than 30 seconds because after a failover, the IP address of that server may change. Uh, if you cache it for an extended period of time, you may be hitting, your application may be uh, hitting up against a, an IP address that is no longer in service. We do not recommend that you turn on simple recovery mode, offline mode, or read-only mode because these modes actually turn off um, transaction logs. And as you know, uh, SQL Server replication uh, real, uh, relies on the, uh, the transaction logs to do synchronous replication. However, rest assured, uh, if you, uh, we will fix them for you if you do accidentally turn these modes on. Now, we can't stress this more. Uh, please test, test, test uh, your application. Uh, test them to understand how long uh, it takes uh, the failover process uh, to go on, uh, because different databases, different uh, storage sizes, different instances, uh, different transactions will cause the failover times to be different. Um, also, you want to test uh, whether your application uh, can actually switch over and connect to the standby instance uh, after the failover. There are also a couple ways to shorten your failover duration. Um, if you do not have sufficient um, I.O. provisioned uh, for your database workload, you may encounter an ex uh, a long uh, failover time uh, because uh, your database uh, relies on uh, I.O. to be present, um, it's sufficient I.O. to be present for database recovery. You will also uh, realize that um, database recovery uh, is dependent on uh, how big your transactions are. So therefore, if you have large transactions, your database recovery times will be lengthened. So we highly recommend that you use smaller transactions to improve the failover duration. Uh, we also suggest uh, that you consider uh, in your application uh, the, that there may be elevated latencies uh, because RDS SQL Server is automatically replicating your data over to a secondary database. However, the, the upside is that your data, your data is being committed to two separate databases. And lastly, we recommend that you deploy uh, your applications to all the available uh, availability zones, um, because if, you're, if a, a particular availability zone does go down, the applications in the other availability zones will be able to take over. Now that we've seen how to build um, high available and reliable databases uh, with multi-AZ, um, I want to take a look at some of the new storage and computing types uh, that will be a uh, little bit more cost effective for some people. Um, now, there are some workloads that are by nature uh, spiky or bursty, um, meaning that uh, you have short periods of high I.O. and uh, CPU utilization. Um, however, most of the time that workload is low. Um, so to help our customers save some money, um, AWS has introduced a new storage type called general purpose storage, or GP2, and a new instance type called T2. Now, these uh, storage and instance types are, uh, have a characteristic uh, that uh, is designed to uh, handle bursty or spiky traffic, um, but yet pro provide a very decent baseline performance throughout. Uh, for instance, for GP2, um, it is SSD-based. It has a base performance of three IOPS per gigabyte. Uh, but it can burst up to 3,000 IOPS per second. Um, its performance uh, scales linearly and predictably and has a flat, a very simple uh, fee structure, uh, flat giga uh, per gigabyte rate. 
um, and also no uh, additional I.O. fees. Uh, similarly, for T2 uh, instance types, uh, they have a great uh, base performance and the ability to burst up to 100% uh, CPU utilization. And uh, you earn credits when your workload is below uh, the base performance. Um, you then accumulate these credits, and these credits uh, are, are available to you for about 24 hours. So how do uh, GP2 credits work? Well, I like to think of it as a leaky bucket. So um, you accumulate approximately three IOPS per gigabyte per second uh, in your bucket. And this bucket can hold a maximum of 5.4 million IOPS per volume. Uh, from this bucket, you can use the credits to spend up to 3,000 IOPS per second. And after you exhaust all your credits in the bucket, you, go, you fall back to uh, your base performance of three IOPS per second. So now let's take a look at a possible uh, real life scenario. Um, Say, for instance, you have a SQL server with 500 gigabytes of magnetic storage uh, provisioned. Now, this magnetic storage costs you 10 cents per gigabyte month and costs you a total of $50 per month. Now, um, every day at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, an automatic report gets kicked off but you notice that the performance is really, really sluggish, uh, and sometimes it does not complete in time for the 8 a.m. meeting for the executives to review the report. So you look into um, provision IOPS, uh, but then you realize, oh my god, uh, this thing costs more than four times the cost of a magnetic. So it's like, uh, that's way too expensive. So you decide to move your database over to GP2. Uh, which only costs uh, marginally more expensive at 11 and a half cents per gigabyte month. And so your storage will cost you only $57.50. So you run your report and you notice that, wow, this is great um, with 3,000, uh, with the ability to burst to 3,000 IOPS, the report uh, gets generated within two hours and is done by 4 a.m. Uh, with plenty of time to spare. You use up all your credits, but that's okay because uh, you get to replenish your credits throughout the day when your uh, usage is low. So in this example, we see that in a low I.O. usage scenario, um, GP2 is only marginally more expensive than magnetic, but GP2 can actually burst up to 3,000 IOPS per second. In the High I.O. usage scenario, um, although provisioned IOPS it can uh, handle, this scenario, uh, handle this case, it is significantly more expensive. In our example, it's four times more expensive than uh, GP2. In the case of Magnetic, it's not even capable of handling such a workload. So similarly, for T2 credits, um, you can use, uh, you can earn uh, t uh, CPU credits when you have a low workload and use them during high utilization. Um, for T2, one CPU credit is equivalent to running a virtual CPU at 100% utilization for one minute or a virtual CPU at 50% utilization for two minutes or two virtual CPUs uh, at 25% uh, percent utilization for two minutes, and so on and so forth. So for instance, uh, you launch a T2 micro instance type uh, that has one virtual CPU, and uh, you're given an initial CPU credit of 30 units. This 30 units allows you to have decent uh, performance during the launch and uh, you earn about six units uh, per hour. Uh, you have a base performance of 10%, so if your workload is less than 10%, uh, you get to accumulate these credits for a maximum of 144 uh, units total. 
So um, if you use up all these units to burst to 100% uh, utilization, um, then if you use it all up, then you fall back to a base performance of 10% of your uh, CPU utilization. Now, it's important to note that uh, these CPU credits do expire uh, after 24 hours, uh, after you earned it, and they are not persisted uh, between reboots. But you are, however, given uh, another initial uh, set of 30 CPU credits uh, upon startup of that instance. So using the same GP2 um, uh, example we see earlier, uh, you see your report will chew up 100% CPU utilization uh, to generate that report. Um, and you use up all your uh, credits during that time. However, you will, you, uh, the remaining time, you will build up uh, your credits again because your utilization is fairly low. We see that T2 is um, quite uh, the cost of T2 is actually lower than uh, T1 micro, M1 small, and M1 medium in uh, most regions. So I'd like to turn our attention now to um, how one can um, design high-performance databases. Uh, most of the time when we talk about uh, increasing performance, we talk about uh, lowering your latency as well as increasing your throughput. So there are uh, a number of very well-established techniques uh, for improving performance. Uh, Push-button scaling, sharding, and provisioned IOPS will help you increase your throughput. Um, provisioned IOPS will also help you reduce your latency. Um, so let's take a look, a deeper look into how these techniques uh, are done. So with push-button scaling, you can scale vertically. So for instance, if you start out with a low in, uh, smaller instance, um, you can, with a push of a button, scale up to a much bigger instance. Uh, and what RDS SQL Server will do for you, it will, it will automatically provision that instance for you and reattach your data, by, uh, your data files for you automatically. Now for um, sharding, uh, it allows you to scale out uh, your databases horizontally, meaning that you can actually take your database and uh, chop it up to small little, uh, smaller databases. Uh, so, for instance, you can use a, uh, a predefined key uh, on uh, the customer ID, um, such as uh, for all customer IDs starting with one, we'll go into uh, the first database, shard, and so on and so forth. Now, um, sharding is not automatic, but with RDS SQL Server, uh, it, we allow you to spin up hundreds, if not thousands, of these servers um, really, really easily. And lastly, um, if you want to improve the I.O. performance of your database, you can purchase uh, GP2 instances or provisioned IOPS to provide high -O, a higher I.O. throughput for your databases. Currently, SQL Server has a one terabyte and 10,000 IOPS limit, um, but you can definitely use sharding uh, to overcome uh, those limits. Um, of course, you can use any, uh, any one of these three techniques in combination or individually to improve your, the performance of your database. Now, um, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming on stage uh, Miguel, who will talk about uh, his uh, experience with RDS SQL Server and how he leverage it for uh, the OutSystems platform. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, hello. My name is Miguel João, and I'm a lead cloud software engineer in the OutSystems R&D uh, department. Uh, I'm responsible for the development of the core framework uh, that supports our platform as a service uh, offer in the cloud. I'm here to share our experience uh, leveraging the Amazon RDS SQL Server uh, with the OutSystems platform. Uh, most of you never heard about OutSystems, so I will start with a very short 
technical um, deep dive of the platform over SQL Server. So OutSystems is a software company that provides uh, the OutSystems rapid application delivery platform, which enables our customers to deliver uh, custom enterprise mobile and web applications faster than uh, traditional technologies. The developers uh, build the applications once for all devices, taking advantage of full responsive uh, design and easily integrate with external systems using web services or uh, custom connectors. They use a visual language IDE, which allows them to build applications faster and with effortless change, and a manage, application man, management uh, lifecycle, which uh, provides the way to deploy the applications across several staging environments up to production. And these environments can be run on the cloud, uh, on premises, or both in a hybrid scenario. So the OutSystems platform architecture has in its core the platform server, which is responsible for application deployment and support runtime activities. We also provide the visual language development IDE, which enables the developers to build their mobile and web applications. We also have an integration IDE which extends those applications with custom .NET or Java code. We have a web management tool to uh, configure the platform server and provide easy access to logging and reporting capabilities. And finally, our application lifecycle management tool, which allows to push the applications across several uh, environments with a single click. The platform server uh, in its core has uh, a database. This is where SQL Server comes in. Uh, it's basically deployed on standard technologies uh, like IIS and JBoss for Application Server, uh, which it's where the applications reside. The platform metadata and the application definition is stored on the database. So when the developer publish the application, it deploys the application on the development environment. This is done with a fully automated process with a single click. Then the DevOps teams can actually push the applications across the several staging environments up to production, also uh, at the push of the button. So how does the platform work with SQL Server. It all starts with the development environment. Uh, the visual development environment allows the developers to build uh, relational data models for the application, uh, rich user interfaces, and core logic workloads, in addition to schedule and asynchronous tasks, and to model and execute business processes. When the developer publishes the application uh, onto the development environment, it starts a process of code generation to actually build the application in the background. Uh, the data model definition is translated into SQL scripts that will then run on the database, uh, but this translation is based on introspecting the existing data model and generating the SQL statements just uh, for the updates required to achieve the new data model. Uh, this is done for tables, uh, columns, indexes, and foreign keys. On the other hand, we also have the application code, which is generated either in .NET, uh, C Sharp, or Java. And um, we optimize the code to achieve the best performance. For instance, if you have a page view which shows uh, data from a database table, we generate the SQL statement to fetch only the columns and the rows that are actually shown on that page view. This improves performance. 
So this is a very short introduction of how the OutSystems platform works on an on-premise scenario using a standalone SQL server. Last year, uh, we've noticed an increased demand for having the OutSystems platform uh, running in the cloud as a service. So with the maturity of the cloud services, we decided to go to the cloud. The question remained, when we launch the infrastructure in the cloud, should we install a standalone SQL server or use a database service like Amazon RDS? So the benefits of using a service like Amazon RDS are obvious. We have out of the box automatic backups, high availability using mirroring, and the ease and the flexibility of deployments using APIs, which allow us to automate the process. So would the platform work uh, on top of SQL Server uh, RDS? We decided to put it to a test, uh, and we early, in the early stages, we bumped into a, a configuration problem, which is basically uh, our initial setup was uh, defining database file settings, which are not supported on Amazon RDS, but they are not needed either. So we surpassed that problem, and we then focus on the deployment and the runtime engine. So all our SQL scripts and the generated queries try to follow ANSI SQL patterns. We didn't expect many problems there, and we are correct. So we were ready to go to the cloud. The next challenge would be how we're going to do it. So we decided to define um, a simple architecture, but effective. And with the push of a button, with a single click, we were able to deploy any number of non-production environments uh, and a production environment taking advantage of multi-AZ capabilities. So we deployed the Amazon RDS with multi-AZ in addition to uh, several front ends uh, scattered around the availability zones uh, behind an elastic load balancer. We added uh, a VPC and firewall with internet gateway to provide the minimum requires for security. So the amazing part is that we automated all this process. And in a couple of hours, we actually uh, bootstrapped a rapid delivery infrastructure to our customers. Uh, when in their, before we went to the cloud, they usually took weeks to do it on their on-premise data centers. So we also extended our management tools to take advantage of the cloud elasticity. Uh, we've built in, in our uh, lifecycle management tool, um, features like adding new front-end servers uh, on the production environment, as well as managing the uh, Amazon RDS SQL server. For instance, increasing the, the storage size, managing backups, or activating and deactivating the multi-AZ option. Whenever one of these um, actions is triggered, it's processed uh, on our core framework. Uh, so we have to build an orchestration framework to support all these requests. Here's a short example uh, of activating the multi-AZ um, feature on the uh, Amazon RDS SQL server, which basically calls an API to change the, um, the mirroring option group uh, on the instance. Um, this is done using the OutSystems technology and the wrapper for uh, the API uh, of Amazon Web Services is done with AWS SDK for Java. So in this simple example, it's as simple as you know, a couple of lines of code to trigger, the, to change the, the option group of the Amazon RDS, and we are now able to activate and deactivate right from the customer uh, front end on the uh, application lifecycle management tool. So it was that simple. Uh, last year, when we decided to go to the cloud, we, we had a great challenge. 
uh, we actually had a very short and tight schedule to launch this offer. In less than two months, we had to uh, design, implement, and release our platform as a service offer in the cloud. Uh, due to the maturity of the Amazon Web Services APIs, the flexibility and stability allow us to focus on our core offer and release on time. Uh, currently, uh, over 50% of our cloud-based uh, customers are using the Amazon RDS for SQL Server instead of other RDS that we support. So this was a very, a bit of our story uh, and how we are leveraging the SQL Server in, in Amazon uh, to deploy our rapid application delivery platform. Uh, if you have, if you are curious to know a little bit more about OutSystems, go to OutSystems.com, try out our free offer, uh, and I'll be available also to answer any questions in, after the session. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Miguel, for that very, very interesting talk. Um, now I'd just like to call upon all of you to uh, try out Multi-AZ if you have not, and also uh, give uh, the t new T2 and GP2 storage types a spin and uh, let us know. Um, I will be up here uh, for the next couple minutes along with Phil and uh, Miguel to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for uh, attending this session.